Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, June 23rd. We're picking up with a quick review. Just get our minds back into where we are. I won't go all the way back to the beginning because my review can get so long we don't get into anything new. <laughs> so looking under Capricornus, which we studied last uh, week, we saw that he is the fifth, that he has a head like a goat. Looking down, the goat that's being slain, and he has the tail of the fish up, like the fullness and the newness of life. We saw that the goat is a picture of atonement, that uh, the goat was slain for the redeemed. It was a picture of the coming shed blood of Yeshua Jesus that would be shed for us. The goat we think of and tie into the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, when the two goats, there were two, one would be. Uh, would escape death but would be sent out into the wilderness never to be seen again a picture of the sins being carried away the other one would give its life in in place of the people that needed to give their blood for their sins yet we'll see that capricornus doesn't end on the note of the death it'll end on the note of the victory of the risen life but to get to that point, we look at the three decons underneath, and we have Sagita, the arrow. This is the arrow all by itself. It's not connected with anything else. It was the arrow of God that was set forth. God shot this arrow out of his bow. We saw last time that his bow was the rainbow, that that is what he called my bow, that he has gifted to us. I had a rough time trying to come up with the colors real fast off the top of my mind, so I Brought my cheat sheet today. We start with the red, shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. We move into the orange. Orange belongs in the gold family that speaks to us of the deity. That when Yeshua Jesus shed his blood, he still was fully God at the same time he was fully man. When we move into the yellow, we see yellow reminding us of the sun, the light of the, the, the day for us. But we see the play on words there that the son, S-O-N, of God is the light of this world. He is the true light of the world. Yahanan, John 8, 12, where he claimed this, and Malachi, Malachi 4, 2, where he would be seen as a son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And we even saw uh, Sagittarius, the winged horse, on the elliptical path of the sun as a picture of the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. When we move from red, orange, and yellow, we come into green. Green is the color of the earth. Yeshua Jesus' earthly ministry is in view here. Four is the number for earth in scripture. It's very interesting that there is a rainbow flower that's nicknamed the eye of heaven. What? A rainbow flower. Its yellow. nickname is the eye of heaven. The eye of heaven. The eye of heaven. The eye, E-Y-E, -E, the eye of heaven. It's the fourth stone in the high priest's breastplate that is emerald green. Again, green speaking best of the earth, of, 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 uh, of what grows. Um, it's a fourth stone mentioned in the foundation of the new Jerusalem. That's Revelation 21, 19. It's the reminder of the covenant with, that God made with the earth, that he would not destroy the earth in this way again. Fourth son of the 12 tribes of uh, Jacob, of Yaakov, the fourth is Judah. Judah, that means praise. We see praise coming up from this earth in the midst of the circumstances because of the covenant God made, because of the rainbow even. So we have praise in the midst of the rainbow. You know, we know it takes the sun and the rain to make the rainbow, and we can see reason to praise God in it. When we praise him and it lifts us up, we are reminded of the throne that is surrounded by a rainbow in heaven, the place of praise. Praise is constant in heaven, like it should be in our lives here on earth. And he alone, Yeshua Jesus, is worthy of our praise. That's why we see a rainbow around his head in Revelation. I think it's him. We move from green into the color blue. Blue is heaven, heavenly or reminds us of the heaven and the fact that Yeshua Jesus was lifted up to heaven. And he lifts us up to heaven also. We see his heavenly kingdom is going to come down on earth. So we see the tie from the green into the blue. Blue leads us into that indigo, violet color. Purple speaks to us of royalty. He is the king. He is royal. He is victor. And we gain victory through his atoning work. Now, when we sum that all up, we have the, the acrostic for rainbow, redemption, arch is never ending blessings of wonder.
I love it. That's our rainbow. That's what we saw last week because the rainbow is hung in space. The work has been done. The arrow has been shot. The arrow is what pierces the Messiah to bring us our eternal destination of uh, being with, with him in heaven one day through the gift of salvation. We also saw, uh, I think, Oh, okay, let me remind you too that the goat, you know, when he's got his head down being slain, it was God who put the sins of the world on the Messiah, the same way the high priest would put the sins of the people on the head of the goat. Now I think I made that real clear, just want to make sure. The second decon is Aquila, it's the eagle. We see the eagle also going down, it's the smitten one falling, he's pierced, he's wounded, he's gasping his last breath in that dying struggle. Yet in the midst of all that, we saw that, that in the throat area was the bright, brightest star. It was bright red. It was scarlet colored. We saw that that scarlet color took us to the reminder of the crimson worm, the scarlet colored worm. Uh, that's the tola'at in Hebrew. Uh, it's the word for this, this worm. And just real fast, um, in explanation for any who did not hear or want that quick review, or maybe are still trying to get it complete in their minds, when it's time for the female tolaat, the female worm, to have babies, and she only does this once in her lifetime, she finds usually it's a tree trunk. It can be something else like a fence, but you know, in, in nature and natural, it is the tree trunk. Attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. She is so strongly, permanently stuck to that tree that she cannot be removed from that tree without it tearing her body. That would uh, kill her on the spot. So if someone comes and peels her off that tree, she dies immediately or, you know, within minutes. She lays her eggs while she's there. Her body is that protective shell over those eggs. When the babies hatch, her body is not only their protection, but it provides them with food. The babies literally feed off of the living body of their mother. After a few days, the babies will be able to take care of themselves and the mother dies. As the mama crimson worm dies, she oozes a crimson scarlet red dye which stains the trunk of the wood that she is on. It also stains her young ones. So when you see her babies, they're crimson red right from the get-go. They are colored scarlet red for the rest of their lives. They will always have that color. After three days, the dead mama's crimson worm's body, um, it, it loses its crimson color and it turns to a white waxy type substance which falls to the ground like snow. That white waxy substance that it has become has medicinal properties in it that number one, help the heart beat smoothly but it also produces a shellac, like a preservative for wood. So we see preservation and we see healing. When we see all this, a picture of our Lord, who called himself this worm in Psalm 20, uh, 22 and verse six, uh, when he, he gave that the picture of crucifixion, we see how he shed his blood. We feed off of him. The stain is there, but the same way that, that uh, it, it turns to white and it has medicinal purposes. Our sins, though they be, well, let me start from the beginning of it. Yeshaya, Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, like the tola'at, they shall be as wool. The same way that that, that shed blood brings the, the white, the healing powers, that's what the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus does for us. And we see that he not only gives us a new heart that beats properly, the circumcision of the heart, but he also preserves us and cares for us till we're home with him in heaven. Beautiful, beautiful picture. One of my favorite story, no, I'm not going to call it story, one of my favorite topics to tell is because of such a picture that it is. So even though this eagle is going down in his death, we see that he brought newness of life the same way the worm did, the same way the Lord does for us. Other um, stars in the eagle showed that he was wounded, he was pierced, and there's even one that's wounded in the heel. Very much tells us that the crucifixion of Messiah from Psalm 22. 
Um, and by the way, look at Hebrews 9, 12 also. Uh, remember how the mama feeds the babies when there's nothing else, she gives her own life for them. We know the Lord gave his own life because there's nothing else that we can feed on that will give us life. The third decon is the Venus, the dolphin. This is the tail of Capricornus. It's the dead one rising again. We see the resurrection. Like they say, we never end all the way through the gospel of the stars. When the death is brought up, the resurrection is brought up also. The fish shows a fullness of life springing up out of the sea. The sea is a picture of death. And this is, um, again, uh, he's coming up out of the water. The fish is, the tail is in that up position. It's uh, resurrection. We even see it in our baptism when we say they go down under the water, speaking of death, and they come up out of the water, speaking of the new life, the resurrection life. That concludes our book two. Um, no, it doesn't. I'm sorry. It concludes our first chapter of book two. The blessings that are procured by his death and resurrection. If he didn't die and resurrect, we would not have the newness of life. So we see it by the goat being slain by the invisible arrow of God, falling in death like the eagle, but rising up like the dolphin, springing up out of the waters into that newness of life. And that brings us to chapter two. And chapter two is the blessings and sure. Okay, and that's what we're going to pick up today. So I hope that review helps get you on that right page. Today when we start, and I put my chart aside, when we start, we're done with Capricornus, but we're going to go just to the very next major constellation, which is Aquarius. And Aquarius, I looked at this earlier, but I'm a bit in the dark here. Aquarius is number uh, six. I'm looking for the six. There we go. Okay, it's on the side of your chart. Okay, you've got somebody else up there, Roger. You don't have Aquarius up there on the left. I've got the front end. You've got who? I've got the Aquarius. What number? Um, okay, and you don't, I've got them all named for you. I'll look at the top. Okay, you're close. There's Aquila, then it should be Delphinus, oh. and then, okay, right. Aquarius. There you go. And there's probably a couple for them. Um, Aquarius is the Latin word, it means the water bearer or the pour forth of water. And I mean, pouring out, you know, pour, pours not, he's a poor person, but pouring forth the water. Okay, let me take you to the scripture first for water, for what we're seeing in water, and then we'll look at it with uh, the sky. Go with me to Yochanan to John chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 37. I'm not going to give you the whole history because it, it's a whole other lesson, but this was a water libation ceremony that was taking place. It is very Jewish. That's why the beginning says on the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah. This is the, the pouring out of the water that's done um, at, at the temple. Uh, again, it's a whole lot of symbolism. I'm not going to take you into that at this moment. But Yeshua took what was happening at the moment, and he took what all of these holy days have been a picture of, and he brought it to life. They're pouring out that water. It shows... Uh, well, the symbolism is all there for, for it being a representation of him. And that's why he stood and cried out at that time, because there would have been a large number. There was a procession. There was um, enjoyment going on, singing. They brought in this water through the ceremony, and then it's being poured out. And that's when Yeshua says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Okay, so we know that the Lord is the one who is is. Has, is the water of life for us. Let me take you back to Bud Midbar, Numbers chapter 24 and verse 5. Numbers chapter 24, verses 5 through 7. We will read there. How pleasant are your tents, Yaakov, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets. His seed will be by many waters, and his kingdom shall be higher than a dog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. How far do I go? That's how far I go. Quit there. Okay, do you see the water is the blessing, the refreshing, the renewing, the, the, it, it allows her even to be life. This then, when you see Aquarius, and on your chart, if you can see it with the picture we have up here, it shows it well. 
it looks like an urn at the top. That's the water pouring out through that. It's a man there that's pouring the water out. And the living water is a blessing is being poured forth for the redeemed. Who is the redeemed? Those that the yes. Lord died for. Okay, he's our redeemer. We are the redeemed. So we are seeing again now this man pouring forth water from an urn, and it seems to be an inexhaustible supply. That river of water is continuous in the picture in the stars. It's not that he's got a pitcher full and it pours it and it goes empty. You can't see a source here. You just see that he's pouring it out. It's not going to end. Uh, in Numbers, it was Numbers 24, verses 5 to 7. And uh, when I refer to Yeshua Jesus, saying, come to me who are thirsty, that was John 7, verse 37. And you can read around there also that some of the verses there are very good too. Okay, now, the flow goes downward and it goes into the mouth of a fish. That fish is, is going to be one of the ones that we're going to be looking at. It's called Pisces Australis. I don't know if I'm saying it right or not. But it'll be the first constellation, or the first decon, I'm sorry, that we'll look at. So you've got um, Aquarius is the man. You've got the water pouring forth from the man, the living water. And here's the fish, that's Pisces Australis. Here's the fish drinking it up, or at least attempting. Mouth wide open to receive all the blessings that are being poured out. Okay, now Aquarius is also called Delhi, D E L I, doesn't mean go to the delicatessen, <laughs> but that helps us remember it. And I believe, if I remember right, um, Delhi means water. Um, don't quote me on that, but it, it ties in with it. Anyway, Aquarius, this one who is pouring out this water, this living water of blessing is the outpouring of the Ruch HaKodesh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it's also the truth of the Word of God, or the truth of the Word. I could stop right there. They are both represented in Scripture by water. Let me show you. Go with me to Isaiah, Yeshia, chapter 44 and verse 3. Isaiah 44 and verse 3. Good pictures up, Roger. <clears throat> Thank you. 44, 3 of Isaiah, for I will pour water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. Okay, there's your picture. There's your symbolism. Now he makes it as clear as you can get. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. God was promising this to Israel. This is Isaiah 44 and verse 3. Obviously, then, the water on the thirsty land, the streams on the dry ground, is a picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the thirsty people of God who are ready to receive his spirit and get his blessings. And how do we get that? By coming into faith, by coming into believing who is the word. We know that uh, Yochanan John 1 said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So we know who is the word? Yeshua Jesus. Jesus is the word, okay? We're also going to see more about that word. Look at Ephesians 5.26 with me. Just ahead of this it is the description of the church. It, it's brought out to be like a marriage where you have the, the head of the home is the husband who is to provide for the wife the same way that Yeshua provided for his called out assembly. How did he provide? He gave his entire life and he brought them into newness of life. So that's a high responsibility for that husband. It is not wife be subject, be under my feet. It is to be a protective um, source for her. It is to be uh, coming in together to receive this blessing. Verse 27 says that he might present to himself the church, the called out assembly, in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, how does he? how is he able to present her in all that glory, not having any sin, no spot, no wrinkle, that she's only seen as holy and blameless? Well, verse 26 told us. How does this happen? So that he, Yeshua Jesus, might sanctify her, and hers is personifying the church of the call of assembly, and here's how it's done. Having cleansed her 
by the washing of water with the word. The washing of the water is the word of God washing us clean. How do we wash clean by the word of God? Because the word became flesh. The word died on the cross. The word rose from the dead. The word puts his blood of atonement on the mercy seat to procure this for us. So we are washed in his blood and we are brought into that state of being sanctified, holy and blameless before our God, not because of anything we do, not because of anything we do once we get saved, he does it all. It's the washing of the water of the word. So both of these are great. Um, I mean, this, this picture is a great way to look at the Holy Spirit, which he gives us because once we are saved, we are dwelt by the Holy Spirit, who Ephesians 1.13 tells us we are sealed with him. It's, it's like the engagement ring that, that you had to have divorce, a divorcement, a divorce proceeding, whatever. Um, to break it, it's not just that it's something that could, oh, well, it's not commitment yet. No, it's full commitment to carry it all the way through. The moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit's our engagement ring. He is fully committing us to be brought to our bridegroom, to Messiah Jesus, by the Spirit of God. He's the one who will bring us home safely when we leave this earth. Do you have a problem? Oh. It's, it's God talking. He's saying, hey, amen. She's saying it. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it has started. So if you know windows open, run. Because <laughs> the ground is getting wet. Um, sorry, folks. We've got thunder going on up here. I don't know what you have where you are, but my room is alive. <laughs> okay, so um, Messiah himself is the water bearer. Think about the woman at the well. Um, that's in Yochanan, John chapter 4. If you want to read that story on your own, read verses 4 through 26. But we see that, that he, she came to get water at the well. He asked her for water. So they go through their conversation. He tells her, if you knew who I was, you would ask for me water because you'll never thirst again. Oh, whoa. I want that water. How do I get that water? And he explains to her where she comes to know and understand is the water of eternal salvation that he was promising her. And she not only becomes spiritually alive, she not only drinks the water, but she runs back to her hometown to tell all her friends, all her neighbors, all her acquaintances, the whole town is going to turn out and meet this one who is the water bearer. Think we ought to be like that? So excited, so cool, so satiated with the water. That knowing is the best thing. And I'll tell you, when you are thirsty, which I just happen to be, <laughs> there is nothing like the water God made to quench the thirst. That's that's what He's saying. And if you feel spiritually dry, if you feel like you're in a desert without any water, you need to come alive spiritually. Get into the word. Remember the word and and uh, what was the other, the, the word and what were my two? The Holy Spirit and the truth of the word. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Look with me also real quickly at Psalm 63 and verse 1. I like to give as much scripture as I can to back up my points. Psalm 63 and verse 1. God. You are my God. I shall be watching for you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and exhausted land where there is no water. Verse 2 tells us where he finds that I've seen you in the sanctuary, seen your power and your glory. Your favor is better than life. My lips will praise you. That's what we can come into also. If you're feeling spiritually dry, Run into the word, run into the presence of the Lord, and I guarantee you, you will come out satiated. You'll come out feeling like you have just drunk a whole river and it hasn't gone dry. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 1 also, often we know these, these first few verses because of the picture that it draws there. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners. First you're walking through, then you're standing and staying there, then it gets even worse, nor sitting in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. That's the word of God. What's the result? Verse three, 
He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. That tree that's by the river of life prospers, has green leaf even in drought time because its roots are grown, gone down deep into the one who nourishes it. Now, we also see that the Spirit is talked about similarly being poured out, and that is in Yoel, Joel chapter 2. We know that this is uh, a near and a far fulfillment. We're going to see, we'll talk about how it was fulfilled partly, but there's a greater fulfillment coming. Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, and I've got the wrong reference, or I've got the wrong thing on my tablet because there isn't any 28. Okay. Here we go. My tablet didn't have it at first. Now it's popping up. <laughs> okay. Yoel, Joel 2.28. It will come after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. On, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. We know that when the church age began, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, came down. It's called Pentecost. It was Shavuot on the church calendar. But it, it, he poured himself into the lives of those that were in the upper room. They saw the flame of fire on their heads. They were able to speak in language they had not studied. And they were able to carry out the word of God to those who understood those languages. That was the start of the pouring out of the Spirit. That's why I say it will continue to be fulfilled in a greater degree. The old men having dreams, the young men having visions. We have heard and seen some of that now, but there'll be even more of that going on during tribulation days when it is all the more necessary because right now in the interim, we have in this called out assembly time, in this what's called the church age, we have the sealing with the Holy Spirit. When we are raptured up into heaven, the Holy Spirit has taken us up with him. That's how we get there is via the power of the, the Ruch HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. Then we know that during the tribulation time that starts down here on this earth, the Holy Spirit is going to come on people to do a work for him. And then he'll leave them the same way in our original covenant scriptures before the start of that, that day of Pentecost for Shavuot, when the, we have uh, King David, Malch David say, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. He had to pray that because he knew, he felt the difference when the spirit was on him and he was moving in the spirit and by the power of the spirit and that close fellowship with the Lord and he didn't want to be without it. But that was the way it was done then. Proof of that in the tribulation period. If the 144,000 were sealed the way that we are with the Holy Spirit, then why are they being sealed again in their foreheads to carry out their work before they even begin their work? It's because they needed that sealing from the Holy Spirit because they don't have the same one that we have in this day and age. So these scriptures will mean all the more during the tribulation period up into the coming of the second coming, the return of the Lord to set up his millennial kingdom. But we see a foreshadowing. We see a precursor of it going on even today. Word of wise, though, not everything that everyone thinks that they have dreamt and seen is the spirit of the Lord. If someone comes to you with those words, test the spirits to see if they are true. If they say anything contrary to scripture, run for the hills, but there are those that that, um, that have had uh, discernment given to them by the Spirit for a purpose uh, in this day and age too. Okay, in our urn, the long, well, the top of the, the, where the water flows out of in our urn, um, that's the word deli. Deli is urn, okay? You are in, and uh, um, it's the container that the water's pouring through. I'll put it that way. Okay, in that urn, there are names of the stars. One calls it the bucket. I think that might be a, a nicer word than urn because we, we associate urns with um, death. <laughs> so if you do call it a water bucket, that fits also, okay? But that is what Della means. I said earlier, I thought it meant water. It's the water urn or the bucket. In the right shoulder, the, the man that's pouring out the water, there's a star there called the record of the pouring forth. I read for you for you earlier from Isaiah 44. Let me go back there uh, and read a couple more verses surrounding that. I think I read verse three to you already. Uh, but starting with verse two. No, yes, I did read verse three. But verse two, 
This is what the Lord says. He who made you, formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, Jacob, my servant, and Yeshua, whom I've chosen. Then he tells about pouring out the water on the thirsty land. And then when we drop down to verse 6, it says, this is what the Lord says. He who is a king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of, uh, excuse me, the Lord of armies, I am the first, I am the last. There is no God beside me. So what we are seeing in that name, it is he who is pouring out. It is he who's Isaiah 44, verses 2, 3, and 6 is what I read this time. That this record of the pouring forth, the Lord has put it on record and he is the one who is pouring forth. The other shoulder means the pourer out, <laughs> okay? The one who's pouring it out. We'll back up to Isaiah chapter 32. Just a few chapters before where you are, verse one says, behold, a king will reign righteously. Officials will rule justly. We can hardly wait for that day. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in an exhausted land. So again, we're seeing that, that personification of the streams on the dry land when our king is ruling and reigning righteously, greatly fulfilled, completely fulfilled in the second coming millennial reign of our Messiah. Look at chapter 33, just one chapter over, 33, verse 17, and then we'll read 20 and 21. Verse 17, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see a distant land. That tells us when this is. When are we going to see the king in his beauty? His second coming. That distant land, the millennial reign on earth of, of and in Israel. Verse 20, look at Zion, look at Israel, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed settlement, a tent which will not be folded. Its stakes will never be pulled apart or pulled up, nor any of its ropes be torn apart. But there, the majestic one, the Lord will be for us. It'll be a place of rivers and wide canals in which no boat with oars will go and in which no mighty ship will pass. And then it goes on. So again, we got, we've got a picture in our minds and i think of venice because venice has where you go you know the streets are, are the canals and it's like that but it's saying it's not that's not exactly the way it is because they're they're not putting in the oars to go and they're not using it for boats but the idea is the land will be just satiated with all the water it needs it will be a lovely place it will be alive in a way that it is not now and this is when the lord is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, the point of feasts will go on. Those feasts that are pointing to the Lord, they will keep those feasts during the millennium as a reminder of what the Lord has done for them. Beautiful, beautiful picture of what's coming. The lower part of the right leg of the man who's pouring it out, the Hebrew there means who goes and returns. Hmm, that sound like anyone we know? <laughs> Someone who goes and returns? Let's look at Yohanan, John chapter 6, 16. I knew 6 was wrong. John, <clears throat> Yohanan chapter 16 and verse 7, where we read, But I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage. This is Yeshua speaking to his Talmudim, to his followers. I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So Yeshua is with his Talmudim. He's telling them, I'm going to go. I'm sure the look on their face was terror. You're what? You're going to leave us? <laughs> You're our leader. We need you. And he's saying, no fear. When I go, I'm going to send you the helper, the Holy Spirit. Why was that even better than he? Because the Holy Spirit's going to indwell each one individually, where Yeshua in his human form was only able to be in one place at a time. So if he was there, like when he we see him with Peter, James, and John, and the others are off from them, they're by themselves. Now with the Holy Spirit coming, they'll all have the, the as if the presence of the Lord right there with them. We know also from chapter 14 of John, just a little earlier than this. He's the Lord's been trying to educate his Talmudim. They're having a hard time understanding it all. Don't fault them for it. 
we have the privilege of knowing the end from the beginning, of reading the whole story and going over it and over it and over it, picking up our Bibles and reading it anytime we want, of talking to others to get understanding also. And they were devoid of all of that. And they're trying to catch on to a whole new way of thinking. So the Lord had to repeat things to them and had to try to educate them. They didn't understand he was going to die and be resurrected. They, they should have because the scriptures foretold, but they're having trouble learning it and applying it. In verse four, uh, chapter 14 and verse 1, the Lord's reassuring them again, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Are we to believe in two different gods? Do we worship two gods? Or as the Jewish yes. people will say, and I mean Jewish not believers, that we worship three gods? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? No. Yes, we worship all three, but they're three in one. So if you're believing in God, you can believe in the Son. Yes. If you're believing yeah. in the Son, yes, you can believe in the Spirit. So don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, because he is separate from the Father when he was here in human form on the earth, Jehovah the Father was in heaven. In my Father's house are many rooms. Uh, dwelling places, however you want to, whatever version you want. If it weren't so, I would have told you, because I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you. See, I'm going again. He's telling them. But here's the next verse. If I go and prepare a place for you, and it really, in our English, it should have been the word, since I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again. I'll take you to myself. So that where I am, there you will be also. That must have made their hearts rejoice. Okay, you are saying you're going, you're going to get things ready for us, and then you're going to bring us to be with you. Okay, we're beginning to get it, or at least hopefully we are. So the description from these stars being one who goes and comes is a perfect picture of Yeshua Jesus. But notice how the water, the Holy Spirit, is constant. Because for us, we have the constant flow. Just stay in the word, stay in the spirit, and you'll feel that constant flow. If you're feeling like you're in a drought, you're the one that's quit drinking. It's not that the water's gone dry, okay? It, it will not dry up on you. Now, with that in mind, we'll look at that first constellation. It is the bottom of the, I mean, the first decon, I'm sorry. The first decon, it is at the bottom of Aquarius. So my picture, if you can see it on cool. my left, on their right, or maybe it's your whole screen, I don't know, where you see Pisces, Australis, that's the fish. Notice the fish right down there. That's the one we're going to be looking at, the one that's drinking up the river of water. He's got his mouth wide open. It doesn't look like it in my picture, but he's supposed to. Um, there's 23 stars in this. It is a picture of the fish drinking in the water that Aquarius, we'll call the man Aquarius, okay? That Aquarius is pouring out. Now, what do fish represent in scripture? And we did this last week, this part of this, so you might remember. What do fish represent in scripture? Yay! Say it loud, Anne. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. Remember how he said, Matthew, you were going to say that? Good, Loretta. Um, okay, where am I? Where am I? Yes, but I'm looking for my scripture. I forgot what I looked up. Oh, yeah, Matthew 4. Matthew 4 and verse, uh, I, just, I had it. I had it a minute ago. I shouldn't have taken my hand off of it. Is it 19? Yes. Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Yeshua, Jesus speaking to them. He's speaking to Simon called Peter. He's speaking to Andrew. They were brothers. They're fishermen. But he says that key verse, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of people. Okay, so they're not going to stay fishermen with a net and uh, you know bait. And, well, I don't know if they had bait, but casting out the nets and pulling in the fish selling the fish at market. He's saying, follow me. I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. So fish represent safe people because when they're fishing for men, they're bringing them in to salvation, okay? So fish represent the safe people. Remember, we're looking at in, in our second book of the redeemed, and we are the redeemed. Who's redeemed? 
the people who come into the blood of Yeshua Jesus. It's going to start with Capricornus, the slain goat, but the fish showing the resurrection life. It's going to end with Aries, the ram, the other sacrificial animal that we see, Isaiah 53 and, and other places in scripture. What's in between? We're going to see what's in between deals with the people who are redeemed by the one who is the slain goat and who is the slain ram, but who comes up in newness of life. So this constellation, Aquarius, Aquarius and our next one are both going to deal with the fishies. They're going to deal with the fish. They're going to deal with who is redeemed. So the blessings are bestowed. The blessings are being poured out. Remember the water being poured out by Aquarius? The blessings are being poured out. They are procured. They are, um, they are, okay, what's another word? When it's procured, you, you know, it's for sure. You've got it. Yeah, I don't know how else to put this. I'm saying it poorly. Um, all right, let me just do the easy way because my mind is, is, I can't think of another way to say it. I'm gonna call up right here real quick. Whoops, let me get out of the links and I'm going to do procurement. There we go, procurement definition. Okay, this will help me. The action of obtaining something. Okay, acquiring something. So when I tell you that the blessings are procured, they're obtained. You got them. The blessings are received. Okay. This is a sure thing. This is what I hope for. This is a sure thing. They're insured to us. That's the word I want because remember, we're in the blessings insured. They're insured to us not because of anything we do, not because of who we are, but because of the man who's pouring them out. Aquarius, who is a picture of the one who goes and the one who comes, he's a picture of Yeshua Jesus. We just saw that. So what we are seeing in this is, remember the, the promise that out of the seed of the woman would come blessing, the one who would bless all? Well, that's what we're seeing. The seed of the woman, we know is Yeshua Jesus. He is now showing that he has procured our blessings for us. He's ensuring them to us. He can pour them out on us now. Those who receive them are those who come into saving faith. Remember Yeshua said, we read it just a few minutes ago in John 7, all who are thirsty come to me and out that they would drink water where they would never thirst again. The blessings will never cease. I love that. We can't use them up. It's not that you get allotted so many for your lifetime. And if you, you're needy and you get a hundred the saving a hundred thousand in your first 10 years that you've got to live the rest of your life. You got your share and you're done. No, the Lord says you need more. Come get more. Keep drinking, keep drinking, keep drinking. I love it. Never, never runs dry. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. First Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Greeks, or Gentiles, or whatever your version says. Whether slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. I like that. No one can come along and tell you you're not the right group. You're not the right people. You're not the right sex. You're not the right status. No, all come through the spirit into these blessings. It's via the Holy Spirit who bestows these blessings on us. The first blessing bestowed on any of us is what I already referred to. I forgot I was going to be uh, looking it up, but here we are, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, so you heard the gospel, you believed the gospel, what happened? You were sealed in him. You were sealed in Yeshua Jesus with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the first installment of our inheritance. So you've come into Yeshua Jesus's family. You're adopted in. You're like, you're like one of the children now. You belong. And the first installment that you receive of your inheritance because you belong is the Holy Spirit. And that he says in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. How do we belong to God? We come in through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, 
but it is the spirit who seals that in us, who makes that our inheritance and carries us home to get it when that right time is. So we're guaranteed via the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not that, that we do anything. We're guaranteed by the work of the Holy Spirit that brings us into Yeshua Jesus and able to stand in the presence of a holy God as a sinless person. Holy, blameless, sanctified. Romans 8, verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. So it's not exclusive. In this world, we have two groups of people. We call them boys and girls. <laughs> we call them men and women. We call them male and female. You can call them whatever you want. They are both. This is what it's saying. They're both sons and daughters of God. You don't cease who you are. You don't morph into some new whatever, but they both come into the spirit. The spirit brings us into oneness with the Lord. For you've not received a spirit of slavery. This is verse 15, leading to fear again. But you've received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba. We cry out, Father. He's our father now. The spirit, verse 16, Test himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So when you have the Holy Spirit within you, he assures you of that. He tells you, hey, you belong. You are a son or a daughter of God. And if you are, you're his children. That's what verse 16 just said, you're children of God. Verse 17 tells us what happens to us as children. If children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Messiah, okay? That means that you belong. You get part of the inheritance. When the inheritance is given out, even though you were adopted in, you get the same inheritance that, that the other would have gotten if, they were, if there were any there, you know, in any other way. You're equal. And we are even fellow heirs with the Lord because God gave the Lord everything. He shares that with us. If indeed we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. These are wonderful promises to us. And if I take you into Roman adoption at that time, they would put on a whole procession when they adopted a, a son in, and I'm saying son, but it could, a child, okay? And the, once this had been done, the name of that one that did the adopting was put on that child. It was even written in a book that would declare this was fact. Same way we go before a judge today in adoption and it's written in the papers and, and the, the, the child can come away with an adoption paper saying that, you know, they, they legally now belong to that parent. It's not just an exchange of words, it's written on paper too. This is what would be taking place. Now, when and we know our god our father our heavenly father never dies but here on earth when that father who adopted that child died that father may have had five of his own naturally and one adopted when they went to divide up the property it was given to all equally you didn't know which one was adopted you didn't know which one wasn't that was all equal that's what we're being told God doesn't have stepchildren. He doesn't have grandchildren. He doesn't have half children. Nope. <laughs> you were fully brought in. And again, it is to all. Whosoever God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. What a precious blessing, promise bestowed on us. Okay, so we've seen our fishy. He's getting satiated. He's drunk it all in. Let's look at the next decon that is um, given to us in relation to Aquarius. Don't move the chart yet. Don't move it yet. Um, because we've got right now on the side, we've got Aquarius right there. Yeah, okay. Pegasus is bumping up against Aquarius's head. He's like upside down. There you go. That's who we want now. Oh. Look at what Roger can do. <laughs> okay, only we want the whole. We've got a winged horse here. Right. You don't see more, you don't see the whole body of the horse, but you see the head of the horse, you see the wings, you see the first two legs. Okay, that's Pegasus. So when you look in your chart, you're looking just above the head of Aquarius, but he's looking, you know, they're upside down from each other. Okay. 
This is Pegasus, the wing, the winged horse, and it means the blessings quickly coming. Now, I got a bit of an argument. Lord, forgive me, but your definition and mine of quickly are two different things. <laughs> because it's been almost 2,000 years and we're, we're, we haven't gone home to receive them yet. But if I could see it from God's view, 2,000 years is like two days. Anybody who looks at two days says that's quickly, okay? So we have to have his view. But this is to show us that the blessings are coming quickly. Right now, we've got a river flowing in this to give us what we need to be blessed here. The greater blessings are coming that are literally out of this world, and it will be when we go out of this world. But right now, we have blessings that are flowing to us. We don't buy these. We don't even go fetch them. <laughs> Never do we see the Lord say, go over there to get your blessing, or tell you you have to go to the store and buy. There's nothing that's done. They come to us. They come to us quickly okay they actually did start coming quickly because if i take you to acts chapter one we have we have such high and low in this chapter when we start out in acts chapter one we've got the lord talking with his his talmudim again okay and he's verse six says when they come together they began asking him now, are you going to set up the kingdom now, Lord? So they kept asking for that, even before his death. Are you going to set up the kingdom? Are you going to set up the kingdom? They don't understand that there's going to be a gap of time in here before the kingdom is going to be set up, and they're anxious for it. They're anxious to see the kingdom of God brought down to earth. They're anxious to see the Lord ruling and reigning. They're anxious to see a time of peace to be brought on this world. And he tells them, it's not for you to know. See, they couldn't understand. If he told them, well, guys, cool your jets, it's going to be at least 2,000 years. <laughs> they would have looked at him like, are you kidding me? But because they could not see and know that, it was a hope for them. And he tells them, it's not for you to know those times. It's not for you to know when that kingdom will be set up. The Father has appointed those times by his authority. But here's what's going to happen for you. Don't worry about that kingdom that's a little off still. And he didn't tell them how long. But he tells them in verse 8, they're going to receive power. They're going to receive the Ruch HaKodesh the Holy Spirit, then they're going to go out and be his witnesses, be testimonies for him, that he promises them that he is going to bring that power to them. The Ruch HaKodesh will come on them. Then I have everything they need to go out for him. That's what we're seeing here, is that power that's that's freely given and that came quickly because the Lord has resurrected from the dead. This is 40 days later. Yeah, 40 days later, and he ascends into heaven in front of them. They see him go up, and he disappears. That's why I say this is a high-low chapter. He goes up high. Their heart said, son, they're watching the one they love. They're watching him disappear. He's told them he's going. He's told them he's coming again, but they're, they're still, can you imagine the emptiness they were feeling? Yet right away, they have the two angels. Isn't it two? Is it two here? Yeah, two men in white okay, who stood beside them. So they're looking at and watching Lord disappear. And all of a sudden, there's two more in their ranks there. And these are in pure white. So you know they're, that they're angelic reflecting the glory of the Lord. And they encourage him. Why are you looking up into the sky? You, who you saw go? He's coming again. They're reassured of that. But then they're told, well, they've been told already by Yeshua Jesus, they were to wait for that power to come. And we know that it was 10 days later, they returned to, to Jerusalem in verse 12. And then they're in that upper room together. And uh, that's verse 13. Then we, we see, okay, um, where does it start? It, it, Peter tells the whole story. Okay, by the time you get into chapter two, it starts, but it was just 10 days after the Lord resurrected in the heavens. 10 days later, they're in their supper room together, and the pouring out of the Ruach HaKodesh is going to come on them and be with them from that point forward. So the blessings are coming very quickly. They come in the form of the Holy Spirit. For us today, 
we're sealed with the Holy Spirit immediately when we get saved, the blessings start immediately for us. That's what we're seeing. The name for the, the, the Hebrew for this deacon does give us the chief horse, okay? That this isn't just any horse, this is the chief horse. And the idea is that this horse is coming swiftly and this horse will bring joy. I like that. Have you ever seen a horse at full gallop? They can fly. They can go really fast. They can fly. He's got wings. Hello. Okay. <laughs> but my point being not literally, but how quickly that horse comes. And this is not a horse that's coming in war and breathing out, you know, the, the fumes and the fire and all of that. This is one who is coming according to those stars. The idea is coming to bring joy. There's other stars in this horse one at the neck it means returning from afar there's one in the shoulder that means who goes and returns there's another one at the tip of the wing that means who carries in the the nostril is the the word for the branch again so who's going who's returning who it, it is going to carry us the branch we know the branch is messiah himself we know Zechariah 6, 12, and 13. We have read this before, that the branch, the one who is coming is the one, and we know that the root of Jesse is the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. This is the one who will be coming. And then there's a star that is in Arabic that means who causes to overflow. What does scripture tell us about my cup overfloweth? That's the joy. That's what's coming. He is coming. He is coming quickly. He is bringing us joy. Even knowing he's coming, we're excited. We're filled with his joy, and that carries us even now. The, in the neck is the word, the waters. So I see in that the waters of blessing that are being poured out, that this one who goes and comes, the one called the branch, is blessing us with now and forever. And overall, it's a picture of the herald the one that, that's, that's heralding this is our Messiah acting as our mediator now in heaven for us, mediating between God and man, bringing salvation to a thirsty world. Remember the dry ground, the thirsty world, Yochanan John 6, he promised that he would, uh, it would be like water poured out on the dry ground and we know he is the the water that we would never thirst again so this pegasus pegasus was that it? yeah the winged horse is a picture of the blessings the blessings are coming quickly and the one who is bringing the blessings the one who opens the door to those blessings for us is the branch is messiah himself that brings us to the third decon in relation to aquarius and this is Cygnus, again, I don't know if I'm saying it right, C-Y-G-N-U-S, the swan. And it's about, um, if you go straight up from Aquarius's head and you see the, the don't, don't go away, don't go away, Roger. <laughs> you see the leg of the horse? Okay, there's the head. Now go to the leg of the horse, the leg of Pegasus. There you go. There you go. Now you're on there, Cygnus. Yes. There you go. Okay, it's the swan. It looks like it's going down in that picture. Um, now, if I hold mine up, okay, here was Aquarius. Here's where we were. And now we're going up. We've gone just a little past the ones that we've been talking about. And we come almost straight up from the head of Aquarius is this swan. It's going sideways in, in this picture when we got it this way, okay? Cygnus is the swan. It's a picture of Christ, Messiah, returning with blessings. It's a guarantee that the blesser will surely return. What he said he would do, he will do. Okay, this is speaking of the great blesser and his speedy return. Again, you'll say, but you've been gone 2,000 years, Lord. <laughs> and I hear the Lord say, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He is coming right on time in the fullness of time. He's coming quickly. And in comparison to all of eternity, it is a drop in a bucket on time, even though we get impatient. And I, that's the right word for it for me. <laughs> okay. The description is a mighty bird flying swiftly in mid heaven. 
He's coming to earth. This bird, this, this mighty bird, belongs both to the earth and to the water. Okay, he's called the bird king of the water. He can, he can fly in the air, he can be in the water, he belongs, you know, to both, okay? Um, on the wing, it, which the wing is rapid flight, you know, the wings are going, that's rapid flight. Um, okay, it's hard to say this, but what I'm trying to say is his wings are showing that he's circling and he's returning. Now, I don't quite picture the Lord that way because I know he's seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting until the enemies are made his footstool for his return in second coming uh, for us seven years earlier in rapture but i like that idea that is like he's just circling and he's returning okay now yeah he's not really circling but do you get my point you understand did i lose you all no okay i think we're good okay so in this majestic bird this mighty bird that's flying swiftly in the heaven we have a bright star between his body and his tail called the knob i don't know anyway it means the judge to come the star in his beak means that he's flying quickly the star in his body is that hebrew that says he returns is in a circle well i see that he'll be seen from the east to the west when he returns in judgment at second coming and it will encompass the whole earth so i can see that in that way two stars in the tail one says he goes and returns quickly and the other is gloriously shining forth we get the whole picture do we not in that he is the judge to come when it comes at second coming he comes as a judge to this earth puts a stop to the enemies of israel and wipes them off the face of the earth he is returning quickly we've already talked about that and it's as if he encircles the whole earth because the whole earth will respond to his second coming he's not coming just to israel and the rest of the world goes on as it, as it, it will no he's coming stopping the battle of armageddon earthquake major geographic rearrangement sets up his kingdom and all the rest of the world will come up there to be blessed it is the gloriously shining forth of the blesser he's shining in all his glory now when you look at the stars the way that that it's been drawn here you see in the shadow how they get the picture of the the swan and make it you know look like the bird but notice how the stars are do you see a shape there in the length of the body and the width of the wings cross good good that's what you're supposed to see it's like a large and a beautiful cross in the skies in fact there are those who call this instead of sickness they'll call this the northern cross because it's the cross in the north remember we already had a cross we had the cross that was um okay we're under under um oh i can't uh, remember his name all of a sudden our two cold centaurus yeah. the cross under centaurus you know we're not talking about that cross that had the five stars the number of grace yeah, there we go. Crux. We're not talking about crux under Centaurus. We're talking about a, a cross that's in the northern sky. That's why some call this the northern cross. It also was ancient, anciently, in ancient times, it was known as the Ruach. You know? It was known as the Ruach. You hear me use that word all the time. Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit holy ruach is spirit so even though it's a picture of cross his ancient name was the spirit like that's the spirit of god which we know comes in the form of the cross to us i thought that was very interesting it's because of the cross that the holy spirit is able to pour out blessings on us and indwell us because of the cross and all the ancient you know all the egyptian the greek all the different um studies of this they all agree that it was some sort of a bird shape this one that we followed called it a swan and we used the picture of the swan some used a picture of a dove and others i forget what the other was i didn't even write it down okay so that they all say it's some sort of a bird shape that they're seeing but why do i like that when it's called the ruach and some say it was like a dove 
Do you remember when Yeshua came up out of the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit came like a dove? And the symbol that we use, even in jewelry and things today, when we see the dove, we know that's symbolizing the Holy Spirit who is sealing us with the blessings of the cross. So, so I like to say it's a dove rather than a swan, but my pictures and everything went with the swan. So whichever way, it's fine. It looks like a swan. It looks like a swan. But remember, <laughs> the picture is the imagination part. The stars are what count. They form the cross. All right. So the sign of Aquarius tells us of his blessings being poured forth. It also tells of the speedy return of him who is to bring rivers of blessings that will fill the earth, satiate all the dry ground of the earth, will fill the earth with blessing and with glory. How will it fill it? It will fill it as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2 and verse 14. Habakkuk in Hebrew chapter 2 and verse 14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I can hardly wait till the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. That will be a beautiful day. Okay, just before I end Aquarius, our next one that we're going to go into is Pisces. I want to give you a certain note. Um, and I'm struggling with this. I understand part of it, but not all of it. Maybe you'll catch something I don't. But, oh, yes, ma'am. You didn't give us the number of the stars for each one of these, and you did before two others. That means that my sources probably did not. I'm looking to see if I just overlooked it. Um, I do not have the number on Cygnus. And where's my other page? Where did I put it? Um, okay, where's my other page? What did I do with it? Yeah, put it down here. <laughs> yeah, I put it down here. I don't always do the same thing. Okay. Pisces Australis, the fish had 23 stars. I don't know the number on Pegasus, and I don't know the number on Cygnus. Okay. I will look and see if I can find it in another source. I'll Google search it. Let me write a note, and I will let you know next week if I can. Okay? Oh, well, I'm just wondering, because you gave us the number of all the other ones right right okay. and i like to because um let's see cygnus and pegasus because it kind of gives us an idea of the size you know it's just another handle on it so i like to when i can so i didn't realize that i didn't i'll see if i overlooked it or if my sources didn't give it um i'm using different sources and i get different okay. parts and they don't all tell at all but um, um okay any other questions before I give us one that will give us a question. <laughs> okay. Now, hear my first words, because you know how strong I am. I'm telling you we are studying the astronomy of God. Okay? That's what we're looking at. The astronomy of God tells the gospel story, the heavens declaring the glory of God. But the non-Christian, the non-believing astrologers, okay, those who study astrology, Satan's counterfeit. The you know they see the horoscope and all of that. They say, and, and I've heard it, and I'm sure you've heard it too. They say that we're entering the age of Aquarius. That that familiar. There's even that song out. Okay. Song, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, for them, the Aquarius is the eleventh sign. You know how we've got twelve. Our Aquarius was number eight, wasn't it? What was no, our Aquarius on the chart? Uh, a charge. Okay. Six. All right. Six. Oh, six. Okay. Ours is six. Yeah. Okay. See, we've got a different order and everything. Remember, we start with the Virgin and we end with the Lion Leo, you know, ruling. Okay. From his coming, first coming, born of a Virgin to his return as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay. Well, they start in a different order. And for them, the age of Aquarius is the 11th sign, 11 out of the 12th. They say that the age of man is indicated by the stars and that each major constellation lasts approximately 2,000 years. So for every, you know, for Aquarius, it's 2,000 years. For Pisces, for Sagittarius, it's 2,000 years, okay? Now, they start uh, their timing, and this is where I get confused because it doesn't follow order for me, and I think that's it a cue that we're in the man's thinking rather than God's. 
uh, but they, they say that beginning with the age of Leo, Leo was about 10,000 years before Christ was here on earth, they say, okay? They're saying 2,000 years for each of these from Leo on. They say that the age of Pisces is the 12th sign. That's why I'm bringing it up now because we're going to go into Pisces. It's going to be number seven for us. It's number 12 for them. That's the last sign of the zodiac in the modern astrology. They say, and here's why I'm confused. They say that Pisces began about the time of Christ. Okay, now if so, Pisces is, is the last sign. And Aquarius was sign number 11. How do you get from 12 to 11? How do you get that the age of Aquarius is dawning when you should be 2,000 years past the age of Aquarius and the age of Pisces? Because we're in that 2,000 year period from Christ to today. So I don't get their logic, but what they said was interesting because they said that Pisces um, is an age of tears and sorrow focused on the death of Christ. Then they say that there's the dawning of this new age that's coming, this age of peace and harmony and freedom. So that's why they're saying. Where you supposed to meet? Yes. Yeah. So, but how do you go from Pisces backward into Aquarius? They, they just don't get it right. And that, that's what I'm bringing out to you. If you get something that I'm missing, you can come explain to me and I'll bring it to the class. But I think it shows you how far off they are. They don't even make sense themselves because they've gone past the age of Aquarius to enter the age of Pisces. So the, this freedom, peace, and harmony should have come before Christ ever came down to this earth. And we should be 2,000 years beyond that. And I don't know what they do if they start it over again. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, I, I just so that you know, because you will hear out there, oh, we're dawning on the age of Aquarius. And you can say, really? Um, if you go by your charts and you start with Leo and you move up, you're not coming into the age of Aquarius. You pass it. You're in the age of Pisces. And this is an age of tears and sorrow. That part, I think they got right. It is an age of tears and yeah, sorrow right now. Sorrow. But the millennial king is going to bring, bring that freedom and that joy and that peace. So for whatever that's worth, figure that one out on your own if you want. I'm just reminding you, it's a very complicated study, and we don't want to get off into what man thinks. I'm wanting to show you how hard I'm trying to stay with what I see as the astronomy of God. When someone throws it at you like, well, how do you know the names of those stars? How do you know that's right? I can tell you unequivocally, I cannot give you scripture and verse that says, Cygnus is made up of the stars by these names. No, I can't give you that, but I can give you that the stars are telling the story, that the stars are declaring his glory, that the stars were hung in space by his fingers, that he calls each one by name. So I can tell you by scripture, yes, they have names. So those names tell a story. The story they tell is the story of our Redeemer in his first coming, those he's redeemed in his second coming. So I'm just reminding you, don't go and, and put this into a level of an inerrant word of God, but where it agrees with the word of God, we can accept. Where it does not, I don't see this Pisces ending in Aquarius beginning. I don't see it by that order. I'm not going to follow astrology. But do I see an order when we start with the Virgin and we go through Leo? Yes. And how did they come up with that? That was passed down. We again don't have a scripture and verse that tells us, but we know it was passed down because we know the Sphinx was the, the face of a woman or the I got it backwards, but you know, it's it's the virgin and it's Leo, the lion, you know, the two one, but that was to indicate where to start studying the stars was by by that. You step, start with the virgin, you end with Leo. So they've just gotten off from that today. Okay, so as we continue on, we can look at Pisces. Pisces is the other sign between Aquarius and Aries. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me, between Capricornus and Aries, between the goat and the ram, the two sacrificial animals, I told you the two in the middle, we'll deal with the fishies. 
Aquarius is, is the man who's pouring out the water and the fish is drinking up the water, the blessings, okay? Now we have the sign of the fishes themselves. And when I call them fishies, forgive me, but everything plural is, is IES in my mind. So Pisces is the fishes. This is the blessings of the redeemed in abeyance, okay? The, the redeemed have been blessed. We see that we have blessings, but we're, the redeemed is still bound. We're bound to earth right now. When we get the fullness of our blessings forever, it's when we go home and be at the Lord, when we're released from being bound, okay? So they are ours. They're guaranteed. You're not going to get there and they're gone, but that's why it says that the blessings are in advance. They're on a hold right now. Not all the blessings. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the river flowing through us. We've got what we need, but there's more blessings coming that aren't within our reach quite yet. Yes. Is that the horse with the wings? Why are you talking about? Uh, Pisces. I forgot to have us call it up tonight. Okay. Pisces is um, number seven. Are we on? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Go just past the, the river coming out of Aquarius, okay. and you see one of the fish. Yes. And then it kind of, you, you see a, a trail between the two fish. Here's yeah. the other fish. Okay, this is the whole area we're going to talk about. Pisces is both the fish. Okay, yeah, you got to, okay, you got to change your chart to get it. Uh, but Pisces is both the fish. We're going to talk about that, the tails. We're going to talk about the band that, that bands those two tails together. Um, Okay, where'd we go? You were talking about, yeah. It's, it's, it's up and toward the top, go up, go up, there. You know, go back a little. Okay, come down. <laughs> right okay. there, you're on one of the fish, you're on number seven. The band is all that twisty, and you see the other fish comes under the wing of Pegasus. Okay, he's got it now. Only one of the fishes is a little bit cut off in the picture. And, oh, there we go. I thought it was where you charted the bit. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about the two fish, the one under the wing of Pegasus, the one that's on, and I forget who, Andromeda or, or Andromeda. I don't know how to say these. She's coming up. We haven't stayed her yet. She's going to be one of the decons. I'll tell you that just so that you'll know where it is when, if we get that far today. Um, but we're going to be talking about Pisces, the two fish. We're going to talk about the band, the, the tail, the rope whatever you want to call it between them. And the band is that where, where one goes out this way and one goes this way. Yeah. Okay, the band is right there. They're banded together there. That's how I should put it, okay? So two fish banded together. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, to answer Doris' question, we got 113 stars in Pisces, <laughs> okay? The two large fishes are bound together by a band the ends of which are fastened separately to their tails, okay? They're two separate, you know, tails. We see that, but they're both banded together at that, that one band, okay? One fish represented with his head pointing upwards is the one that's pointing toward the North Polar Star. I believe that's the one by the number seven, but you know what? I can be turned around. So don't quote me. One of them is pointing toward the North Polar Star. The other is shown at a right angle. So maybe maybe I am wrong right there. Anyway. But the blue one is correct. Hmm? This one's correct. The blue one is pointing to the Northern Star? Yeah. Okay. It looks like it's going north anyways. Well, I would have thought the yellow one was that. Yeah. She said the one that's leading up to one. Um, yeah. I'm, well, we're trying to decide that, and oh. this is something I couldn't do ahead without seeing the chart with the Did other. Did you say that the Pegasus was at one time uh, referred to as the Northern Star? star? It wasn't or, Pegasus, or that, it was. Uh, I think it was Cepheus that was once called. I'd have to go back and look at what was once called the Polar Star. But we know the Polar Star moved. Remember, it moved from being in the dragon, Draco. Oh. And it's moved over to, we'll see it finally when we get to Cancer. It said Cepheus, like the king? 
Yeah, but so that's not what we're looking at right now. It's just simply the two dishes. One of them is pointing north toward the polar star. I'm just for sake of purpose right now, because it looks like it in my picture on my left or right, the one pointing up, I'm going to call that one the one that's pointing toward the northern star, because to me, up is north. So, okay. And then the blue, the one that's at a right angle, that one is swimming along the line of the ecliptical path. Okay. If okay. I had read it all, I wouldn't know. So the one by the number seven on your chart is the one that's pointing toward the northern star. The one that's on the elliptical path is right there. You see the word ecliptic right under the other fish on that chart, the one under the wing. So that's the one at the right angle. So our yellow one is north going toward, pointing toward the northern star. And our blue one is the, on the ecliptic path, right angle, the path of the sun. Okay, the Hebrew name for Pisces is Dagi. D-A-G-I-M. This one I know I'm pronouncing right because dog means fish in Hebrew and I am is plural. It's like S or E-S for us in English. So doggy, that means two fishes, two or more fishes. Oh, okay. not D. D is in David. Okay. Yeah, D-A-G-I-M. Um, I guess that's not going to be on the outline that I gave you. A-M? Uh, D is in dog. But G is in David, A, G is in, well, I think G is clear, I, M is in mother. Okay. In Hebrew, I, M, Elohim is plural. It means gods. Now, we know our God is one, but he is three in one. Okay? We are at the top of page four, by the way, that will help you with some, but it doesn't help you with the word we're working on right now. But we are in our outline. We are at the top of page four. We're in chapter three, the blessings in abeyance, the blessings that are held at bay momentarily. Not all though, but, but there are some still to come. Okay, now the fishes are closely connected in scripture with the multitudes. We got a lot of fish. We think a lot of people in the same way. Let me give you an example. Bereshit, Genesis 48, it'll be a long time before we get there, <laughs> but one day, Genesis 48, one day we will get there. Genesis 48, verse 16 says, um, the angel who redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. This is Joseph wanting the blessing on his two sons, um, you say Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim in, our, in Hebrew, but when um, he's taking his boys to his father Yaakov, Jacob, to bless them, remembers when the hands were crossed, you know, the younger was going to be more blessed than the older. It's at this time, Joseph is saying, bless my boys. May my name live on in them, the names of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzhak. So Jacob's invoking the blessing, the blessing of his father and his grandfather on his grandsons. May they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Okay, the multitude is like a lot of fishies. May they grow into, we also call it the sands of the, the sea. You know, we talk about that, the sand on the seashore, you know, the stars, the big, the big family, okay? So fish, it's like an increase of people. Fishing is, fishes are multitude. The children of Israel, God, um, Jacob was asking for them to grow into a multitude, okay? What I'm getting at is a multitude can be blessed by the Redeemer. The Redeemer's work is not just for the Jew. It's not just for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, and who comes out of them. But the blessings are for the multitudes who come into faith believing. That's what it is for. It's for the Redeemer's work is for all mankind who will come into faith believing. Now, the three conjunctions that I talked about when we studied the star Bethlehem, the three conjunctions of the planets, Jupiter and Saturn, was at the time of the birth of the Messiah, we see, and I say that with the question mark, we see that those three conjunctions took place on our calendar approximately at the end of May, 
at, in October and at the beginning of December, okay? Let's just say, for sake of argument, let's just say April, May, September, October, and December, okay? Those were those three conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. When those three conjunctions happened, Pisces was the one where the sun was going through Pisces. You remember this, this is the path of the sun. The sun was in the sign of Pisces at that same time as those three conjunctions. Ancient Jewish authority said that the, the, the mark of an occurrence of an event that is favorable to Israel would always happen in the sign of Pisces. So they related Pisces to something good happening in Israel. Now, it is interesting and only interesting, that's all I'm saying. Kepler, a German astronomer, lived in 1572, lived into the 1600s, 1631. He calculated backwards because you can tell things, you know, like the comets that are in order, you can tell the path of the sun. He, he calculated backwards and he found out that phenomenon of Saturn and Jupiter coming together like that, always related to a historical, sometimes they were crisis, sometimes they were just an historical figure that was born that was major. How he did this, I do not know. I'm not telling you, I know it for a fact, but he said that he could find it, that the revelation that God gave to Adam was, was at this time. The birth of Enoch was at this time. The revelation to Noah was at this time. The birth of Moses was at this time. The birth of Cyrus, who puts out the decree for the people to return, was at this time. The birth of Christ was at this time. But then he also says the birth of Charlemagne and the birth of Luther were at this time. So those were great people to him. It's interesting if this is true that it happened at the time of Pisces, but that's all it is. It's just interesting. What I will bring out is that Bible commentators, ancient Jewish authorities like Josephus, um, Avenal, Eliezer, and others, they all agree that Pisces did seem to have a specific reference to Israel, that it was a sign in relation to Israel. Now, when you remember God has his angels, he has archangels, he has those that, that have specific assignments. We know that Michael, Michael, is the angel for Israel. We know the angels are given territories that they're to be in charge of. So it could be in God's vernacular, if I can put it that way, it could be that the sign of Pisces is in relation to Israel. It doesn't have to be, but it could be, okay? And we do know that at the time of those conjunctions happening, the sun would have been traveling through if, if I'm saying that right, but on the elliptical path, he would the sun would have been right there where Pisces is. Okay, could that be why the early believers adopted the sign of the fish? Pisces being the fish, the sign of the fish meaning that they are believers in Yeshua. Don't know. We really don't know why they chose the sign of the fish. We just know they did, and we see it in ancient times. We see it on cave walls where they hid and got together to worship. You know, we, we see it to carry on through time. I think that we could also say, the Lord said, I'll make you fishers of men. So that's why they took the symbol of the fish because he made us to be fishers of men. So I'm not giving it to you dogmatically. I'm putting it out for thought. But if, if it is... The sign is foreshadowing the multiplication, the blessing of the children of promise. Remember Genesis 22, 17? If not, let me give it to you right now. Uh, in Genesis, there are sheep, 22, and verse 17, we have, Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand, which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Even says that in your seed all the nations will be blessed. And we know when it comes down singular, it's in Yeshua Jesus, all the nations will be blessed. Okay, but we, so that's Genesis 22, what? 17. Okay, Genesis 22, 17. So that could fit with the fulfillment of that. But also look at the body of Christ, the church age, uh, the believers, Jew and Gentile, who make up this time 
in Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and verse 29. Whoops, I went too far. Galatians 3, 29 says, If you belong to Christ, if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Now, that doesn't mean that the only, the, the only ones who belong to Messiah are of the natural children of Abraham. Because remember when Yeshua took on the, the Pharisees and they were coming against him and they even went so far as to say the miracles he was doing, he was doing by the power of Elizabeth. They were equating God's power with satanic power. Even then, Yeshua said to them, you're not, you know, the children. You're, you, okay. The, the bottom line, he says, you're of your father, the devil. They tried to say that their father was Abraham. That's what I was trying to bring in, okay? They're calling him out, and they're saying, we're good. Our father's Abraham. We've got it right. He's saying, your father's not Abraham. Your father's the devil. He's a liar, and, and you're following the law. He called them out. So this is not in any way saying that you have to be Abraham's descendant to be one that, that is joint heir with the Lord. No, you're brought in through the work of the Lord. You're brought into the promises that God gave to Abraham, even when he said he would bless the world through Abraham. That's what we're seeing, that we're joint heirs with him. So it includes the body of, of Christ, the church, in that promise. If we're seeing this as a sign of the blessing for the children of Israel or the children of promise, we have to see it for the children who are receiving the spiritual promise, the blessings of being in the Lord's family. We are going to see that we're talking about spiritual seed and earthly seed in these two. The same way that Abraham, when it was given to him, um, and we just read it, the stars, uh, you know, the stars, uh, uh, like the number of the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea, so would his offspring be. We said that was true, that God was promising Abraham a multitude would come from him. But we also saw that that was not what was given to him to declare Abraham righteous. What he was declaring that brought righteousness was seeing the story told in the stars that told of Yeshua and his atoning work. So we see the double layer there, and that's what I want you to see. Because a fish that's shooting upward, or one that's pointing toward the northern star, that would be a picture of the spiritual sea. We're going up. We're being, you know, we're in the Lord and we're going up. Then the fish on the horizontal that is in relation to the sun and its relation to the earth, that would speak of the earthly sea. Okay, so we could see two elements. We could see the spiritual seed and we could see the earthly seed. Let me read to you Romans 11. And I'll tell you why I think this is important. Romans 11. We're going to look at verses 1 and the start of verse 2. Verse 1 says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Far from it. For I too, Shaul Paul speaking, I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And I say, exclamation point, hallelujah, preach it, call, preach it. <laughs> That's Romans 11, verse 1, and the start of 2. I'm getting on my sandbox. Let me read you a couple more verses, and then I'll explain why. Verse 5 says, in the same way then, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Okay, so number one, God's not done with Israel. Number two, he's got a remnant. Now drop down to verse 26. And in verse 26 we have, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So if this is speaking of the remnant, the remnant are those who have their sins taken away. Paul says in another place, not all is uh, all who say Israel is of Israel. What he's talking about is just because you're Israel, just because you're Jewish, 
does not mean that you're part of the remnant. It doesn't mean that you're promised eternal life, that you receive all those blessings in Yeshua. God has a remnant. That remnant we know is made up of Jew and Gentile, that they're both in that. Remember, we're joint heirs. We saw it. It didn't matter if you were Jew or Greek, free or enslaved, rich or poor, status or not. You know, it didn't matter. Let's slavery free and covered that. Okay. What we are seeing here is number one, God's not through with Israel. He does yeah. not replace her. He does not say, Israel, I'm taking back all your promises. You get nothing. Here, church, let me give it to you. No, we never, ever see that. God never did that. He did not say either, though. Oh, all of you, every single one of you, just as you're born Jewish, oh, you're the apple of my eye. You're my chosen. Let me pat you on the back. You're a good little guy. And let me let you know all your blessings. You don't have to do a thing. You don't even have to believe in my son. You just get it because you're Jewish. No, no, they don't get it that way either. When Paul said, what advantage does the Jew have? It was that he had the oracles. He had the word of God that he then had to come into the commonwealth of Israel to hear the truth to be set free. Or they may hear and come in because they heard out there. Like Rahab, Rahab, she heard, she believed in the God of Israel, and it, she was spared when the walls came down. She had that scarlet cord. We talked about that last week with the Tola Ot. But what we're seeing here very, very clearly is both are brought into that remnant. Not all of Israel will be saved. In a way, it's saying it here when it says all of Israel will be saved, it's not in the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel will never have an end. They will come into the fullness of the blessings with Messiah sitting on the throne, reigning from Israel, blessing the rest of the world. And that's what it's referring to. It's not referring to individual salvation, saying every Jew automatically is saved. I am Jewish. If I had not opened up my heart to my Messiah and said, come in, wash me in my sins, be my savior, then I would not be part of this promise. I would be cast out. I would stand before God in the day of judgment for the, the good and the bad I've done and cast into eternal fire. Okay? Hallelujah. I opened my heart. He called me and I answered. The same way for the dear Gentile. This is not showing that anyone has an end, but it is showing God is not done with Israel. And there's so many that want to say that today, and I even want to say to them, the church has had 2,000 years. Show me where the church has done better than Israel did at getting the word out and taking it to a world and, and doing all representing God to the people and the people to God. Show me where the church has done better than Israel. I will show you churches that have, then I will show you church as a whole has not. Church as a whole is Laodicea as well as Philadelphia. We've got both alive and well on planet Earth today. We have churches that you go into that preach the message that I just preached. The death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, Jesus for forgiveness of sins, and they tell you once you're saved, take it out. Get the word out. Share it with others. That's the Philadelphia church. It tells you to get into the word of God, read the word of God, study the word of God, pray, develop your, your walk with the Lord. That's Philadelphia. If you're in that kind of church, go, back it up, help it, be a part of it, spread the word. But if you're in a church that is doesn't crack open the word of God and it isn't telling you you need to have your, your walk developed you need to, to stand you know you need to be corrected at times you need to grow and if it isn't telling you take the word out get out of that church that so-called church and get into one that is doing good because if it's on fire for the lord it's going to tell you you need to be sharing it with everyone around you no one is given an excuse to not so you can easily discern whether you are in what is the, the remnant or what is not. It's easy to tell the difference, but our fish are talking to us now again. We see Israel on the, the, uh, the ecliptical, 
we're looking at her earthly promises. Israel as a nation will go into the millennium. She's going to make it all the way through the tribulation and she will go into the millennium. The people who go in will be just the saved people. The rest will not go into the millennium. They will be cast out. We've already talked about that. So we're seeing on the one side, this earthly blessings fulfilled. This is God keeping his word. God unconditionally promised to Israel. God does bless Israel. The spiritual we see is heavenly. It's above this earth. Our spiritual blessings, I love to say it, are out of this world. They're greater than this world. They're really greater than Israel's blessings here on this earth because we're in the holy city of God. That's our headquarters. We're in heaven in his presence with him forever. We're not bound to the earth anymore when we go into that. We are free to go throughout the universes and the universes and universes and wherever else. Our blessings are greater. They are more numerous than what Israel will receive for a thousand years during the millennium. So we see heavenly spiritual promises. Israel has been promised earthly spiritual promises. So you say, well, what about someone like you, Rochelle? Aren't you both? <laughs> I'm a Jewish believer. I have a connection to the land of Israel. Yes, but not in an earthly connection where I will stay down here, live through the tribulation, and go into the millennium. No, I go up in rapture. The rapture isn't for Gentiles only. The rapture is for all who believe. That means Spanish, English, Korean, Filipino, Mexican, Swedish, Jewish, whatever. All believers are caught up and have the heavenly promises. The earthly promises stay to the earthly seed to fulfill the promise that God made to the earthly Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when he said that, that these would be blessings on the earth. We have two separate sets of blessings. I guess I could put it that way safely. We have one way of salvation. The Jews don't get saved any differently than the Gentiles get saved. The Gentiles don't get saved apart from how the Jews get saved. We all get saved through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. But he has, I'll put it this way, he has a program for Israel that brings Israel through the tribulation and into her millennial promise. He has a program for the church that brings us through this time period called the called out assembly time, the church age that ends in a rapture when he carries us up to heaven. We receive our rewards and we come back to rule and reign with him in Israel's earthly kingdom. Okay. I think I made it clear, and I hope I did, because there's so much teaching out there that is so off. I just saw the clock. I was ready to keep on going, <laughs> but I see I need to stop here. Let me just say um, there is a star on the, the ecliptical, the fish on the ecliptical, that's called the United and that's Ephesians 3, 6. That's we're all one body. Remember I read that we're all, we come into the same spirit. We're all one body. And there's on um, the fish pointing northward, there's a star that's called the upheld. And that would be God fulfilling the promises spiritually that he's given to both Jew to, to Gentile. I mean, we could even see God keeping his word to Israel and God keeping his word to the church. I'll pick it back up there next week, just in short form. I won't go into all of this explanation. Then we'll look at our three con our three decons. We're going to look at the band, that part that connects the three. That's going to be the first one we look at. If you want to look ahead of time, Andromeda or Andromeda, however you say it, the fish is on top of her. We see right there, you know, look at the fish by number seven. The other side, Roger, there you go. That's Andromeda, it's right there. See how she's chained? We're going to talk about the chained woman, and then we'll finish it off with Cepheus, which go past that one, go right to the next one, up, 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 right there. Oh, this one? Yeah, see the crown? There you go. Cepheus is the crown king. So those are the three we're going to talk about next week. The band between the two, and it's interesting. Andromeda chained, and we'll see a change come for that. And we'll see Cepheus, the crown king, 
which you all know who that is. That's our Redeemer who's coming back to rule and reign. He's wearing the crown. So it'll be very, a very interesting study, I think, next week. Also, forgive me for those of you who are supposed to end by about 3.34. I missed it once again. <laughs> but I hope it's been a rich study for you to see the, the faithfulness. The one who redeemed us is pouring out blessings on us. They've only just begun. The greater, the better is yet to come. So hang in here. Keep moving. Um, well, I say hang in here, but the Lord's done it. Even if you let go, the Lord's still got you. Just, just you'll lose blessing because uh, you're not in right fellowship. But um, I'm going to close in prayer fast and then ask for questions or comments because of the time. Okay, that way those who need to go can. But then you got a question? Yes. Okay. Is the band the string that holds the two fish together? Yeah, technically it's right where they're banded together, but, oh, okay. it, but it is part of that string oh, okay. or that rope, you know, that um, I look at it like a rubber band. That would be like the rubber band. <laughs> and, and this is what it's holding together, that you can pull two things together by the band. Okay. All right. Any other questions? We'll get in just a moment. Let's close in prayer. Hallelujah, Lord our God, we praise you and thank you that you are faithful to every detail of your word, every jot, every tittle, every dotted eye, every cross T. Thank you that when you have promised us, you fulfill it. Thank you that you will never forsake Israel and you will never replace her. Thank you also that you brought in those of us who are your body, who are the, the call to the assembly, to be grafted in and to provoke Israel to realize all oh, that she has let go of the promises. She's let go of you. She's let go of her future. But Lord, thank you. You will bring her back into that and she will receive all you've promised because you are faithful. Thank you in your faithfulness. You have saved us and you keep us. And we know that we know that we know when we leave this earth, we go home to be with you forever. Hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you. And we thank you for giving this to us, even in the stars alone. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's open up the mics. Let's get comments, feedback, questions. What is the